everybody. Welcome to another episode of Tech Done Different. I'm your host, Ted Harrington. With me today is my special guest, Will Lin. Will, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Ted. Oh, that's an honor. Totally, man. So, Will, you're awesome, which is why you're on the show. I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit, but to, I guess, give our listeners a little context of how we came to be chatting, um, you know, I was out to lunch with a, a very well-regarded CISO in the security community, and we were both just sharing ideas about uh, sort of what's going on in the industry now and the future of the industry. And your name came up, I mean, almost immediately in that conversation. And you were the first person, you were the first follow-up item I had after that lunch was, you know, this friend in common said, you have to meet Will. <laughs> and uh, so I called you up and we, you know, I got on a video chat and it was like, we're instant buddies. And so, so here we are. So uh, maybe you could, you know, you're, you're obviously a, a venture capitalist. You're really focused in the security space. So maybe you could do the audience just a brief introduction about kind of your viewpoint, your experience, and, uh, and we'll dive in from there. Yeah, no, thank you, Ted. I'm, I'm really honored <clears throat> to even have that mutual friend uh, to, share, to share that feedback about me. I appreciate that, Ted. You know, I would say that, um, you know, I, I am, I'm honored to be a venture capitalist. I think a lot of what we do is we, uh, we you know, we're in the, in the industry. We're meeting a lot of portfolio companies. We're meeting a lot of startups, talking about innovation every day. And as part of that, it just allows us to get really deep into understanding what's going on in, in, the, in the industry. A little bit of context on me. My name is Will Lin. I'm a part, uh, partner at a firm called Forge Point Capital. And, you know, Forge Point Capital started about 2016. Initial goal was to only do cybersecurity. And that's what we've been doing for the past uh, five years. Um, we got lucky as well. Initial team of three. We th didn't think we would you know, get too large of a firm, but we ended up um, uh, more than tripling our team size. So we have about 14 people in our investment team today, which makes us by far the most active and largest investor in security startups. Um, and one of the things is sort of different mindsets that we have because we have such a large firm, because we only do security, is that we're not just focus on one portfolio company. Uh, you know, we have, so we have what, 30 security companies in our portfolio. We can't just be pitching one over and over and over again, because that, you know, what about the other 29 that feel unloved, right? And so what that means is that we end up spending a lot of time focused on the problems themselves and spending a lot less time selling and pitching and a lot of time focusing on solving these issues. Um, and so because of that, uh, I think we're, we allows us to think a little bit differently per your podcast. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fascinating too, to, to hear you describe inherent, I'm, I'm reading between the lines of what you said here, but to hear you describe what it is that you do. I mean, I think a lot of people think about uh, venture capital as money, which inherently that is what you're doing. But yes. what I heard you say, and correct me if I'm misinterpreting what you're saying, but uh, what I heard you say was that really your role is more than just providing the capital, but also to help your founders actually succeed. Uh, is that a correct read on how you perceive yourself? Yeah, yeah, completely right. I mean, I think when we dedicate towards only one sector, it allows us to do things a little bit differently. So meaning helping the founder succeed, it's more than just you know asking them great questions at, in board meetings. It's also about, it's about talking to them on a weekly basis and helping them deal with not just, hey, uh, finance is off, you know, <laughs> your metrics are off. You're not making enough revenue for, you know, all that good stuff, but we're also talking about product. We're helping them shape the direction of the product. We're helping them build their team members. Like, okay, you know, this is a key gap that you're missing in the industry, uh, in your team. And because of this key gap, you're not able to talk to the industry or, or solve the industry's problems adequately well enough as well. And so because of that, you know, knowledge and, and focus and context, we're, we can be a bit more hands-on with our entrepreneurs um, as well as, you know, when you talk about money, in some ways, the way that, that we're thinking about it is less on, hey, this is a good investment, let's go make it. It's more on, hey, this is a good problem. And I think this is a good answer to that problem in terms of team, in terms of product, in terms of thesis, focus, and all that. And this is us putting our money where our mouth is, because we truly believe in it that much. And we're willing to put our money as well as our time to help that solution end up becoming real within the ecosystem. Wow, man, I love that that framing that this is a good problem. Uh, I'm gonna noodle on that for a long time. That one idea because I think <laughs> that's that's really powerful. Um, so walk me through that. How do you yeah. 
and you might not have an actual framework you've articulated, but yeah. how do you determine what is a good problem that is worth solving? Yeah, and this is one where, um, you know, this is the same stuff that we advise our startups or to our CEOs, right? Like, hey, at the end of the day, customer is king, right? Like, they are the ones that are solving the problems. They are the ones that have the budget. Or they are the ones that are tackling this on a day-to-day -day basis. And as a result of that, um, when you ask about what's a good problem, it's, that's all, it all comes from the customers. Um, the, the really nice thing, though, when thinking about customers is more than just like doing surveys or like case studies or, you know, it's classic business school stuff or talking to analysts or whoever it might be. But there's also a sense of being able to understand the ecosystem, like ears to the ground kind of stuff. Right? We're like this set of people are going to have this set of problems. And this is going to be a must have for this set of people, but a nice to have for this set of people. And this set of people are not even going to even recognize that as a problem. It's not even important to them um, because of this, that, and the other. And so one way of thinking about this whole thing is also in terms of what percentage of customers will have this problem. And I think most everyone assumes that you invest in a startup, assuming 100% of all CISOs or customers are going to have the same problem. And thus, it's going to be successful. And what I'll say there is, if even 60% of all customers have the same problem, and they all standardize on you, that's when you become a public company, like CrowdStrike. Like, we can't even say that 60% of all CISOs out there are CrowdStrike customers. They're probably, what, 20 30%, probably maybe even lower. And yet, CrowdStrike is a public company. Right? And so it, just being able to tackle and reach a certain percentage of the whole market is the, the difference between a public company and not. And there are going to be some companies that people where people invest in and they think, oh, this is going to solve 50% of all CISOs have this problem, when in fact only 5% of them have this problem. And 5% sounds like a very low number, but what I'll say there is even 5% is enough to create a company as well. Um, so execution is so, so important. But I guess the going back to the original summary, it's all about the the practitioners, the people who are actually so, work, have, you know, solving these problems on a day-to-day -day basis where you can sort of identify what's a, what's a good problem to solve. I'm hearing a theme emerge from you, which right. is this idea of being narrow. You know, you've talked about the company that you founded. You want it to be narrow. You wanted to focus on security. And now when you're talking about the problems that you invest in solving, focus on a narrow segment who has that problem. It doesn't have to be everything to That's everybody, right. but it has to be the thing that matters to that subset. Uh, is that a correct read on the way that you think about uh, approaching the different things you're approaching? I think so. It's definitely very much of a focus thing or a depth versus breadth kind of thing, right? If you go super broad, it's very hard to have depth. Um, and then, um, and so because of that mindset, you know, when you're a new firm, there are all these other firms with 50 plus year histories uh, in the venture capital space. How do you compete against those 50 year old firms? Mm -hmm. It's by focusing, right? You go, go deep. Um, you really understand the space, be very successful. Um, maybe over time you expand it, but you know, that level, that differentiation that we will, will be able to provide versus someone else in the space is going to be always going to be our depth. So why do you, I don't have the answer to this question about to ask. I'm curious. Maybe you do. <laughs> yeah. So I totally agree with you that having a focus and um, depth over breadth is that's that's the secret. And it's not even a secret, but that's how anything is going <laughs> to succeed. Right. But why do we think that it is that when we look across the landscape of security companies, whether it's companies that sell just products or companies that sell just services or companies that sell both, it seems like every company is trying to position themselves. Not every, but it seems like many companies are trying to position themselves as experts at everything. Like, um, I mean, you know this, you're, you're invested in a company in the penetration testing space. Yeah. If you Google penetration testing and you go to any one of those results, <laughs> most companies are like, we're, we do SOC and we do compliance, we do penetration testing, we do physical right. security and we do hardware. It's like, you can't do all <laughs> of that stuff. Why right. do you think that exists? It's a really good question. And I think it's a question, it's also a symbol or a, of sort of what's going on within the industry or what do people think about? Um, because there is a very, there's a reason why this exists. And I think a lot of it is because a lot of people's initial assumptions are that that needs to occur. And then 
uh, and then it keeps on perpetuating itself over time. And so these unspoken assumptions are really, really powerful. And I think one unspoken assumption that people do have sometimes is like, hey, in order for me to be successful with a customer as a vendor, I need to be tackling a decent number of problems for them so that, you know, if even just one out of 10 hit, I have a better opportunity or better chance of working with them. But sometimes, and I'm not saying this is the case for every single company that does 10 things versus one thing, but sometimes, especially the ones that are newer in, the, uh, in terms of this journey, um, they don't realize that the customer actually wants to hear someone being the best at one thing. Um, and um, and that, is a, that is just a natural learning that most vendors, company people have to figure out over time that they really like that specialization. They really like that prioritization. But a lot of people's initial assumptions tend to be, let's go broader versus more narrower. And I think the, so the best way to summarize that is that they haven't uh, gotten enough customer perspective yet to be able to see that nuance and to understand that nuance. Um, and one reason, another reason why this all happens is when you look at the big companies, right? You know, the, the Cisco's, the Palo Alto's, the Symantec's, you do see that there's, they're tackling so many different problems. They're not just tackling one. And you see that they naturally expand over time. And they're just thinking, okay, so that means in order for me to be, to be a big company, I need to do a lot of different things as well. When it's, again, there's a different scenario. When you're a tiny startup, everyone wants you to be point solutions so you can be the best of the best. And when you're a big company, everyone wants you to be broad so that you can have all these pre-integrated solutions um, so that you can be that one throat to choke kind of scenario or one vendor to work with versus, you know, having to work with a hundred vendors, for example. Yeah, that's a really good insight for sure. I, I, yeah, I agree with all that. Definitely the, the idea that you're, you're a new company, you look at, well, who are the established companies and what do the established companies look like? Well, they've got, 57 different service offerings. So I've got right. to probably look like that too. And there's probably another part of the problem here that yeah. plays into this as well. I mean, I think about just even uh, with our own company, one of the things that we struggle with, and I'm sure that some of the companies that you're invested in struggle with this too, that different terms actually mean different things, but they're used interchangeably <laughs> yeah. and they shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to be like, well, if you use one of these 10 terms, you really mean yeah. this one term and we do that, right. but we have to sort of have the the receptacles to find the people who say the wrong term yeah what's your take on that do you think that's a pretty widespread problem too yeah yeah definitely a huge huge problem and that's why so many websites start sounding the same over time right because it, it's sort of like a you know um like giving up kind of scenario right where it's like i just I can't differentiate because these terms mean so many different things to everyone else. I'm just going to have to hit a certain bar and say a certain number of keywords and hopeful. And, you know, and so everyone who comes in, they might not really be a customer, but it'll be my responsibility to like talk to them more and figure out whether they're a good customer or not. And that's why you see some companies that don't even have a website at all. They're just like, I give up. I'm not going to even try to try to compete with all these weird terms that um, come across so differently. You know, for instance, one example is um, VPN. Like there's a next generation evolution of VPN today. And we will say uh, when, you know, practitioner asks another VP, uh, practitioner, hey, what are you doing in terms of your next gen VPN problem? Uh, you could either be doing, looking at the, the, the classic stuff like secure Pol, uh, Pulse Secure and Palo Alto and all that. Or you could be looking something as, as much as like a proxy for like developers to log into uh, or to, to uh, just push their code through. Uh, on a VPN side. And so it's, it's the re and this is, goes back to the point I brought up before, right? Like when people invest in these problems and these vendors, uh, you're not going to solve the problem for a hundred percent or even 80% or even 50% of all customers out there. You're going to solve it for a much smaller percentage than people realize because everyone's thinking about the problem so differently. And so if I'm a VPN company, my, what I'm actually doing might only solve the problem for 10% of the customers out there. And one of another company might only solve it for like 20% and, and vice versa as well. It's, it is definitely an annoying thing to do. And luckily as VCs, we, we spend so much time looking at websites, listening to pitches that we can, you know, hear the, like you can read in between the lines and figure out what they actually do. Uh, but we don't expect, you know, it's unreasonable to expect every other CISO out there to be going to every conference and like listening to all these different pitches. We're spending what? 60% of our time listening to pitches, meeting new companies. 
you know, what kind of practitioner <laughs> can spend that much amount of time just looking at new companies, right? So in that way, I do think we have an unfair advantage as well. Yeah, definitely. And the more of them you read and, and listen to, yeah, it probably starts to... It starts yeah. getting a little bit obvious over time. Yeah, it's like, okay, I know you actually do this. You say this because you think this is what you need to say, but you actually do this. And this is a good problem, but for some reason, you're not willing to talk about this when uh, instead of you're talking about this. And a lot of it is because they looked at their competitors' websites and like, oh, those they're talking about this as well, so I should talk about this as well. Um, yeah, that's such uh, a hard problem, right? If you're, you're building your own problem. website out, of course, you're going to look at what the competition says, and then right. that starts to in you know, worm its way into your brain. And yeah. all of a sudden now they start to sound similar rather than different, which is certainly not a good thing. Exactly. Yeah. I ran into this similar struggle when I was, uh, as I was writing my book and I was trying to decide on the title and I got really good advice when I was going through that which was, yeah. you know, this book, I, I wrote it really about securing software and, but the principles, like the principles of security, they apply to pretty much every domain of security. Like, how do you think about defense in depth? How do you think about threat modeling? How do you think about yeah. actually finding vulnerabilities and, you know, resolving them? And, but the advice that I got along the way, which was, was really good was to say, you know, serve your primary audience first and then your secondary audience, you know, maybe they come, maybe they don't. But if you try yeah. to serve both audiences at first, your primary audience doesn't know that it's for them. Yes. It sounds like this is what you're saying too about websites. Like speak to your primary audience and don't worry about the others at first. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the point uh, and it makes sense on your book and also on a personal branding piece, right? I mean, I think one of the things, find the people who really resonate, who like you for you. And just spend a lot of time with them. So don't spend time spend trying to appease people who don't like you for you or trying to change yourself because it's just not a productive use of time. And I think people will always be surprised. The people who like you for you, there are plenty of people out there uh, that for you to be happy and successful and however, whatever shape it might be um, as well. And so, and that definitely comes out to startups. And that definitely comes back to the point around like, even if you hit 5% of all CISOs, that is a great company. That's a great problem to solve. Yes, you won't become a public company, but you are creating a, you know, a company of value and you are doing something useful and important to the ecosystem with the ecosystem. Find people who like you for you. I mean, yeah. Will, you're giving me like 15 bumper stickers that I have to go put on my car now <laughs> as a result of our time. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really fun. I mean, I think um, one of the things that I, I, I kind of people I am, I'm a very like systems thinker. I really like believing that everything makes sense, that everything works together for a reason, right? Like our economy is what it is for a reason. Our government, it is what it is for a reason. All of our sources of innovation are it is a reason for a reason. And so what I like doing is trying to figure out all these different reasons why they are, it, they are what they are. And, um, and why does the ecosystem exist? Why does venture capital even exist? Like, why do we do what they do? Like, when, you know, is it just money? Is it more? Is it something else? Who knows what it is? But I think over time, because of that mindset, because of the, oh, like, why, 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 why? Now I finally have, I have a sense of like, okay, this is why, like, this is why this person exists. This is why, this is the value this person can do and should do for the ecosystem. And this is how they can do it as most efficiently as possible and be ha you know, satisfied and happy with both the value they're creating as well as being satisfied and happy with themselves as well. And so um, it has turned, it's amazing how much this role has actually turned very philosophical for me. When I, when, I, when I initially thought it was just be like, oh, I just invest in innovation. I invest in cool startups and cool ideas and I'm going to change the world. But no, it's actually, I'm spending all this time thinking about how the world works and why things things are the way they are instead. Yeah, that's rad. I mean, you're you're lucky that that's what you get to do all day, every day. And it's funny hearing you just describe that sort of mental process that you go through. And it struck me how it's like when we were little kids, that was the way we look at the world. We ask why and we ask how about everything. And then somewhere along right. the way, we become adults and we stop doing that. Yeah. And it sounds like what I'm hearing you say is, I'm totally putting words in your mouth right now, but <laughs> if we were to sort of rediscover that childlike wonder and curiosity, that's how we reveal these broader truths about what's happening around us. That's exactly right. You, you, you clicked on the word exactly, curiosity. And 
when I think about these people who I've met, who I'm just incredibly impressed by, um, I, I always manage to find some version of curiosity in them. I think that's so incredibly important, right? Because the world's always changing. Uh, <clears throat> never, nothing's ever going to stay still and no one's ever going to hand feed you like, this is what you do next. This is what you do next. This is what you do next. Right. So like if you stay very much in the, the tactical all the time, you're going to lose the why things happen. The things are the way they are. And then eventually you're going to run out of next things to do because you just don't know because there isn't someone there feeding that to you. But if you stay curious and you keep on asking that why, then the next step is it becomes very obvious. Like, okay, this exists because of this. So I, in order for me to do this, I need to do this. And then it just becomes obvious. The next steps just keep rolling on onto next to each other. And so that's, that's something I think is super important. And, um, uh, to anyone, in, including, of course, my role, but also entrepreneurs, practitioners, um, even, you know, any, anyone in the world, I think, needs to do that, continue to do that. And it's hard, to your point. It's really, really hard. <laughs> yeah, and there's a maybe even um, in, in addition to the difficulty, there's a almost a mental block as, as I'm thinking about, I'm just thinking about the people who I've been lucky to work with or who, yeah. you know, work for me and things like that. And it seems to me that younger people earlier in their careers, uh, they, there's a fork for sure. Um, some people are relentlessly asking those questions and other people hesitate to. And I think it's because they feel like, well, maybe I should know the answer to this. Yes. And that's in fact not true. <laughs> if we assume <laughs> we know the answers, then we're not going to be learning. Right. So how have you seen, or I guess what's the advice to people to get over that maybe fear of looking or feeling stupid because you don't know the answer to something and, and why it's actually good to be asking these questions? Yeah, I think that it's a phenomenal question and something that I've been thinking about a lot as well, just because of course I'm working with a lot of really experienced, really thoughtful people in, in every in every shape or form and across every, whether it's my team, external, elsewhere. And I think though there are a couple of different reasons why that uh, is the way it is. But you know, instead of digging into why it is the way it is, now the the question was how do we get over it? And in terms of getting over that piece, I think a portion of it is being very comfortable with couple of pieces. One is something we talked about before, not like find people who like you for you, right? If you need to pretend that you know everything uh, in order to be successful, that means you will care about some people who don't know you, you, who you really are, one thing. And the second thing is, and the th uh, this is attached, but also different. And this is more of a macro perspective. Because information is flowing so easily now, right? Like those podcasts, everything, it just information is is out there. You just need to find it kind of situation. What's happening is that people are more and more valuing authenticity. And part of authenticity is being able to say, you don't know what you don't know what you don't know as well. And so I think sometimes those folks feel like they don't know, or they feel that it's not around, it's, it's their perception is more important than their authenticity. But I think that, that, that whole paradigm has shifted because of it, because of the internet, because of information. Now it's less around, hey, what do people think of you uh, in terms of uh, this vision of you? But more importantly, is, does this person authentic? Does this person actually know what the heck they're doing? Uh, and can I trust? It? Is it worth me spending more time with this person as a result? I love it. You know, we're we're on this podcast about technology, <laughs> about security, and here we are talking about being authentic to yourself. I mean, that's yeah. if that doesn't define doing things differently. I mean, I don't know what does. So that's such a powerful insight how how authenticity matters and 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 hopefully people who are listening to this right now are that resonates with them and they say, "Hey, it's okay for me to raise my hand when I don't know, to go find the thing Maybe I don't even know yet that I don't know because that's the yeah. path to growth. So I want to uh, I want to ask you about a a principle that you hold mm -hmm. that you and I have talked about before. And the first yeah. time you mentioned this to me, I almost like slapped the screen of the video <laughs> chat we're having. So I was so impressed. I was like, I want to know more about this. Yeah. So let's talk about this idea you talk about um, where your compensation is essentially helping others. I, I'm going to butcher it. 
you're the man, yeah. you do it. So, so tell me, you know, tell the audience first what the principle is and then kind of give us yeah. the background. And I want to ask you some questions about it. Yeah. So, um, I think the, uh, the principle here is, is different and, um, and it touches, I'll start with some of the business school terms that people hear all the time, like synergies and value add and all the things that people hate hearing. And, um, and, and, and it builds into why those exist. Like, why are those words even words? Like, why do people in business school talk about it? And then I'll build into sort of my, you know, my part of all that. So first of all, the whole concept of value add. Value add for me is something along the lines of, hey, I'm doing something for the, I'm creating something that is of value, right? Someone's going to pay for it or someone appreciates it, that, that kind of thing. And when, when a lot of people think about value add, they think about stuff like very interpersonal stuff, like, oh, I help this person, I help that person. But reality, when, when I think about value add, is something like, what change are you creating for the ecosystem in terms of solving real problems that haven't been solved before? And I think um, at the end of the day, venture capital, startups, innovation, all that is centered around that problem, which is, hey, there are these unsolved problems that need to be solved, and someone needs to do the work to get that done. Um, and so as venture capitalists, or as for, for me, I think a lot of it is how many of these problems am I actually solving? Like, am I actually making a difference in the world? Or am I just playing with money and like, um, and you know, putting in one, putting in one dollar into the machine and getting three three dollars out. Like that's one way of thinking about it, and that's a lot of the way a lot of people think about investing. Um, but when it comes to venture capital, I I view it as much more of a what problems are you solving and what value are you creating as a result of it. And so the way I think about my role is how mu- how can I just solve as many problems as humanly possible. I don't have to worry about making money because I'm helping create so much of value. It's inadvert. It's I'm going to inadvertently keep some of that value as well. And so I don't, that's something that I just don't need to spend a lot of time uh, doing. And so the best way to just summarize this, the whole spiel I just did is that my role, or at least I feel that my role is lucky because I'm compensated by how much I help others, like how many problems am I actually solving. And by being able to do something like that, it's very rewarding. You know, you really feel like you're making a difference in the world and you really feel like you can, um, you know, you can, that's the sky's the limit. You can keep on going for forever as a result. I love it. it. It's so powerful. And, and I think part of the reason it resonated with me so strongly is that I, I've done a lot of self-reflection in my own life and I've sort of identified these four principles that drive the decisions that I make. And it was, it was a really revealing process to look and the way I had to do it was I had to look backwards on, I, I felt like I couldn't, I didn't have the words for what these principles were until I saw all the things that I'd been doing. And I looked back and it was like, that decision was because of this principle that I didn't realize that I had. And um, one of those principles or a couple of them are, you know, I want to do hard things that matter in the service of others. And then the fourth one is get better every day. Those are my like sort of four defining principles. And what you just described is, is sort of all of the first three right? And, and probably the fourth, I think, is inherently in that as well. But the idea that, you know, it, what's the point if you're not really helping other people, but if you are helping other people, then that's going to derive value for yourself as well as for those other, other people. So, um, I mean, that's, I just totally inserted myself into your value. So no, I know. That. <laughs> no. And that's one of the things I want to make sure to say as well. Like, it's not just VCs who do this, right? It's every entrepreneur also has the ability to do this. And I could even say like, you know, anyone who helps others can do this, doctors, politicians, who are, um, this isn't something that is uniquely focused on just the, the role that I do. And I think that's very true anywhere in the world. Like, let's talk about doctors, right? If you are helping others, if you're curing cancer, like, do you really need to worry about getting paid at the end of the day? No, like the people are going to come to you and ask you, please help cure cancer more or do more of it. And um, as a result, so, um, you know, the world is, the world is not perfectly fair. Like we all learn that the world's not fair, um, but there are certain things that you can do just with knowledge and with value creation that you can make sure that that at the end of the day, it's all works out for you. Like it's, you, you'll, you'll be fine. This isn't one where 
you need luck in order to uh, in order to make sure you capture some of the value that you've created. Like you need luck to, to create some of the value for sure, but you don't need luck to make sure that you are adequately rewarded for your for your efforts and for the you know the results you've created in the world. At least now, right? Like yeah. comp surveys are all over the place, right? Like all this data, like there's no more surprise of who makes how much, or rare, it's less of a surprise of who makes how much because all that information is out there nowadays, which is, you know, I think one of the benefits, one of the very, very, very many benefits of the, the internet, right, is information. Sure. I love it. It's, it's such a powerful, uh, powerful concept. And hopefully people can chew on that and think about how to apply it in their own lives. So, Will, as we wrap up here, uh, yeah. maybe you could share with us your thoughts on what's coming around the corner. I mean, certainly as an investor, that's what you're always thinking about like what's the next right. big thing what are the societal trends what are technology like where are things going so for the benefit of our audience here what do you think sure. is is coming around the corner what should people be thinking about yeah you know i like phrasing this in a phrase in a structure that i've seen um you know the analysts use there's like it's top 10 security projects of 2021 kind of thing that gartner did recently and, uh, and so for me, I was thinking about what are the top 10 recommendations I'm going to make for others, right? Because what it, the reality is everyone's going to be a little bit different, uh, but what are at least a set of 10 that I can recommend that at least will, at least where at least one of them will resonate with almost everyone um, as a result. And so I do have a list of 10, um, 10 ideas I could share if, if that, would, that would make sense that would you. The, let's do it. Let's, let's go through them. All right. So list of 10. All right, and this is in order because I haven't tried to figure out what's most important. Or um, and then the other thing is that you ha also have to think of these as mixed and matched as well. Like there could be one of these in um, in another one, but I think of them primarily in terms of how we describe them. Like if I'm if I'm with, it's been my company and I'm describing a project to my team or to my to my boss or to the board. Like what were the words I use? And so. Um, so this is less technical and more focused on like what are categories of, of innovation or projects that might make sense. So 10. So, uh, and they're also not in order yet, uh, yet either. As, uh, I will decide to order eventually, but um, I'm not done yet. So first of all, and these are also decent we brought. So first of all, the um, I, I love talking about data security. I think that because of COVID, because of work from home, a lot of people are talking about data security. Talking about protecting data has been sort of one of the oldest things since, you know, in terms of security as well as like, hey, you know, the reason why I'm doing this network thing and this endpoint thing and this application thing is because I want to protect our data. So data is an important one. Cloud, I think is going to be very obvious. You know, a lot of people are also thinking about their shift to hybrid cloud or public cloud. So I think cloud is going to be another project that's going to be very common. They talked about in 2021. Identity, it's going to, everyone's going to spend a lot of time doing that. And this is an example where it's even broader, right? Because you can do identity of data, you can do identity of cloud, identity of other things. But I do think that there was there are going to be people who have a project specifically focused on, you know, how do we improve our identity program? I think there are going to be a certain set of companies <clears throat> where they don't even talk about like classic categories. And they're just going to say, hey, we need to be very, very targeted. And it could be a data thing, it could be an endpoint thing, it could be a network thing, but we need to address work from home. How do we how do we address that uh, in 2021? How do we evolve that and push it forward? Because a lot of people have to do that super quickly. Vendor risk management is going to also be a project I think that a lot of people will spend time thinking about this year as well. Uh, because you know, with vendors, you don't really have as much control over what they do with your data or with your inf information or uh, with the processes that you sort of let them help you with. And so I think that will be a common one. Endpoint, I think Endpoint will see a lot of shift um, this year because, you know, we're all, everyone's moving to, um, you know, certain leaders within the Endpoint space on the antivirus response detection side. But I think there's also more things that will happen on the Endpoint category in 2021. And so I think these people will will definitely create a program around the next gen of endpoint in 2021. I think some folks will focus on evolving SOC, uh, their SOC um, capabilities, whether it is internal, uh, you know, their existing SOC, improving it, whether it is uh, outsourcing that SOC to a third party, or whether it's building it for the first time, whether it's internal or external. But I think there's going to be people who spend time sort of evolving the SOC 
2021. This one's super duper broad, uh, but this one's going to be focused on digital transformation, right? So how do you enable the business units to take advantage of all the latest technologies? Um, and, um, and that naturally sometimes involve, it means cloud, sometimes that means um, identity, sometimes that means DevSecOps type stuff. But I think every company sort of defines digital transformation differently, and as they should, right? Because a company in retail should think about digital transformation very differently than a company in healthcare, for example. Uh, I think DevSecOps is going to continue to be a project that will, will pop up in 2021. I think we've seen a lot of momentum around it. So I think, you know, finding more ways to help the developers do things more securely will be a, another really popular one. And then lastly, I think one will be, um, and this is, you know, it doesn't sound different, but it is different in my mind. There's DevSecOps, which is like SDLC centric stuff. But then I don't think there's going to be like um, application, more application security stuff, which is more focused on externally facing uh, exposures and visibility. So um, this is going to be stuff like the um, uh, like next gen bone scan, for example. So instead of scanning your internal network, scanning your external presence as sort of the next another iteration of AppSec. But that's not the only iteration that we'll probably see in AppSec, but I think we'll see people develop projects around them. So that is 10. It's, uh, um, it might, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of projects, but I wanted to make sure to be broad enough that it at least touches one per, per company out there. But my ultimate goal is that, and as every uh, practitioner recognizes, usually they only have time to get like three to four projects in a, in a list of 10 done every year, right? There's going to be some that are must do, and there's going to be some that are nice to do or nice to haves. And in that, in that sense, I think these 10 will probably be a good chunk of almost everyone's top 10 projects, not, but in the end, I only think, you know, three or four of them are going to, you know, become a 2021 project from beginning to end as well. And so amongst those, there, um, I think the three that were going to be the most popular is going to be data, identity, and cloud. I think those three will probably, uh, people will spend the most time thinking about those three in terms of not only, only thinking about the project, but actually getting that project done in 2021. That's such a good list and such a great way to organize the different domains even of security. And it, it still kind of blows my mind that we're talking about cloud like as this new thing that's happening. I mean, cloud's been around for decades. <laughs> But yeah. uh, I, I remember even, it was probably like six or seven years ago, I was you know, giving a talk at um, some conference and someone was asking about cloud, but the way they phrased the question was really interesting because it was, it was inverted from what I, at the time, thought everyone believed. And they, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something like, well, since no one's going to be using cloud in a couple years. And I was like, what now? <laughs> I thought, I thought everyone knows that cloud is the future. So uh, right. yeah, I guess we have a ways to go. And if it's still, a, you know, looking like a top priority project this year, then, then maybe there's more runway ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it is. In, it is crazy um, how uh, there is still a lot of misconceptions around cloud security, even though we have some companies who are like hundred percent cloud uh, hosted and then their entire security program is so mature that they're even like sharing open source stuff, right. With, uh, with others. Um, but I think it's what it is, is really a signal or symbol of, you know, how much, um, how hard it is to move from one technology to the next. And, um, and that, that's a key difference between enterprise and consumer. Uh, in enterprise, like, let's go to consumer first. In consumer, you don't like something, you turn it off. You uninstall it, you stop using it, it's done, right? Like, they don't get any more of your data, they don't get every more, more, more money, you know, it's done. When enterprise, everything's on a multi-year basis, generally, right? Not only, there's a contractual multi-year component, but there's also a multi-year component of just the momentum of moving off of something to something else. Um, as well. And so there's a, there's a lot of these key natural differences um, that have to, that come into play when it comes to enterprise versus consumer. And that's why sometimes when, you know, uh, someone's working with an enterprise vendor and the enterprise vendor jacks up the price 2X, 3X, like some insane dollar amount that some customers still pay it, 
right? Because it's, it's going to take so much time for them to move on to something else. Or, you know, they, they sort of like, okay, it's actually worth two or three X because they locked in a really low price before. But more often than not, it has to do with like, hey, this is something that's a part, of, part of my core process. I use it. I depend on it. It's, uh, I, I can justify keeping it for a little bit longer while I look for something else. And, uh, and that little bit longer is usually measured in terms of years versus like a week in the consumer world. Right. Yeah, change is hard. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the summary for sure for most companies. So, Will, thank you so much for all the insight today. I personally learned a lot from our conversation, and I hope that everyone listening did as well. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Ted, for having me. It's a ton of fun. I always, I love this conversation. Thanks for making it possible. Awesome, man. man. Awesome. And, and for everyone else listening, if you want to get more information about this particular episode or future episodes, or you want to be on the show yourself, go to tedharrington.com backslash podcast. And we'll catch you next time.